Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for coming and joining us for this special partnership between the Kentucky Office Forum and the University of Louisville, the College of Business. Uh, this is uh, part of the week of where we're celebrating leadership, um, purpose-driven uh, purpose organizations. It's part of the Vince Tyree uh, Family Lecture Series. And we're really pleased to have today as our special guest uh, for the Kentucky Office Forum, Casey Gerald. Would you all please give him a round of applause? I uh, was sharing with Casey um, earlier in our conversation that um, I read the book starting last night, 10 o'clock, and I finished it this morning at, um, I started at 10, read till about 12.30, got up at 5, finished reading it, and was done by about 10. It is a marvelously written book, uh, a beautiful narrative. I uh, said to Casey that um, I, the son of a Baptist preacher, there were several themes in it in which we were just, uh, we were sharing uh, the same kinds of themes. And I especially uh, thought that um, you, with your background, uh, having um, an MBA degree from Harvard, the Harvard Business School, Yale undergraduate, um, a degree, and then being a superb athlete, this is going to be a great forum for us because we have students who are student athletes, we have um, uh, current MBA students, we have future MBA students, and so this book uh, just hits right across those, uh, all of those things together. So there we go with the great, it should be a, a great conversation both today and tonight. Cool. So why don't we start with this, because uh, I think uh, the, the students wanted us to start here. Let's start with South Oak Cliff uh, in Dallas. And, uh, and you tell this wonderful story about Y2K, 1999. It's about 11.30, maybe 10.30, yeah. uh, on the last of the year, and the world's going to end. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I grew up, I tell people, kind of in like the ISIS of Christianity, you know, and it was like very fundamentalist uh, Christian, which is fantastic for, for me at the time. And we thought that uh, the world was going to end uh, December 31st, 1999 at midnight. And I had turned 12 that year, which meant I was now accountable for my sins and all this kind of stuff. So I had spent the year getting really prepared. I got baptized again, and I read. Um, I didn't read very much growing up, and so I uh, read part of this novel called Left Behind, and I wanted to kind of see what would happen when Jesus came. And... Um, then the night comes and my grandmother picks me up and we go to church. My grandfather was a pastor, so we had a church down in Dallas. And we go and everybody's packed into this thing and, you know, uh, this is going to be it. And 11.50 comes and the pastor says, okay, everybody come down to the altar. And I'm going down to the altar. There was a clock in the back of the sanctuary. So I'm watching the clock. And I hold on to my grandmother's hand at the altar because I figured I knew she was going to heaven. And I thought that if, she, if Jesus came and took her, then maybe like I could just kind of like grab hold and <laughs> sort of grab hold and fly away with her. Um, and so we're praying, and it's hot, and it's, it's intense. And, and, and then the prayer ends. And, uh, and I look around, and we're still there. And it was uh, really heartbreaking, actually, because I write in the book, I did not want the world to end. I wanted to be rescued, and the rapture has seemed an elegant solution, that I would instantaneously disappear, mm -hmm. go to this place where I would never be hungry, mm -hmm. I would never be sick, I'd never be sad, and in the meantime, everybody who had wronged me would be punished, right. and they'd go to hell, and they'd burn forever. <laughs> I just thought this was fantastic. You know... Uh, my, my mother had, at that time, started to disappear. She suffered from mental illness and was sort of in and out of psychiatric hospitals and was on the, a few months away from disappearing for five years. My father uh, struggled with drug addiction, um, was, I, I believe, in, in, in jail at that time. Um, I was sort of living uh, uh, from sort of, Pillar, box, to, pillar box to post, car to box car. yeah, from pillar to post, man, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and, um, and nobody wanted me, you know, kind of thing. It was like, 
well, who's going to take him this week, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was really tired of being on earth, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. I was ready to go. Mm -hmm. So here's a way out. I was like, you know. And so when that didn't happen, I say in the book, In the Place of Paradise, I had to find the kingdom of this world. And so much of the journey from that night when I realized there wasn't going to be some kind of miraculous escape from this nasty earth and nasty life that I was living, then the question became, well, what now? What do I do when the world has ended? And I think um, it's not just a theological question. It's a human question. So many of us go through experiences where it feels like our world has ended, you know, and I think how we respond and, and what we turn to in that moment is, is one of the big questions of this book. Well, the other um, part of your experience at that time is trying to find your identity in many, many different kinds of ways. And, um, but one, one, one avenue in particular seemed to be around this game called football. I mean, you're in Dallas and, um, and you're the son of a rather famous uh, football player and um, his name is Rod Gerald. Now, would you mind telling the story? Because I actually saw the game. Really? Oh, yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm old enough, right? <laughs> that we, he almost young, set the age, isn't it? Oh, no, yeah, that's right. I'm old enough. 67, you look great. right? You right. Look great, man. But it was 77, right? Yeah. It was it, 77. Ohio State is playing Clemson. And your father is the quarterback for Ohio State, yeah. Woody Hayes. Now, tell us the backstory. Yeah, my dad is still considered by a lot of people to be one of the best high school football players in the history of the state of Texas. And um, went on to play quarterback. He was the second black quarterback in the history of Ohio State, played for Woody Hayes. And his sophomore year, he broke his back against Purdue in a game. And so he's out for five games. And then Ohio State makes the Orange Bowl. And Woody wants him to play. Mm -hmm. And he wants to play because this is his identity. He's 20 years old. I, my hand is... I, when I was 20 years old, I broke my hand in a game when I was playing at Yale, and we were playing for the championship the next week. And I write about this in the book. Yeah. And, I, and honestly, at 20, I would have done anything it took to play in that game, so I understood my father. So anyway, game comes, and a guy approaches him and says, um, you want me to give you something that will help you play like a champion today? And he hands him an envelope full of cocaine. And my dad takes cocaine for the first time. He has the game of his life. Mm -hmm. He's Orange Bowl MVP. He brings Ohio State back from, they were down 10 nothing at halftime. They wound up winning 27 to 10. Mm -hmm. And he became a legend. And he never played another game without uh, using. And after that, it's things were spiral from there. Now, mm -hmm. by the time I was born, the only story I got, I walked into class one day when I was in sixth grade, and my teacher, Ms. Davis, handed me a copy of the Dallas Morning News, and on the front page, above the fold, was a picture of my dad behind bars. And nobody had told, warned me about this. You, you know, y'all probably not want to go to school one day and, and find out that way. And it said, uh, once the pride of Texas, this was the headline, once the pride of Texas, South Oak Cliff star, saw life sacked by drugs. The only story I got was, here's this reckless dude that threw his life away for dope. You know? But the reality was a lot more complicated than that. Here was a guy who, mm -hmm. when he actually needed somebody to be there to help him heal, he was asked to sacrifice his life and his body for a game. Mm -hmm. And when he didn't perform what they wanted him to perform anymore, they just kind of discarded him. Mm -hmm. So the football, in a lot of ways, this is a sports book. And the football material, in part, is not a... a condemnation of the game of football, which means a great deal to me and so many people that I played with, but the system of football. So now we have that first, second element of doubt. Yeah. Right? But you don't, but at this point, you don't doubt yet. Right? I mean, you, you're laying the foundation for what will become doubt later. Mm. But um, there's an element, um, because you don't quite know the whole story of your father yet, you will find out much, much later. So, but uh, let's go on to, um, you uh, as an early, as a student early on, you apparently had a gift for uh, oration. Did you get that from your grandfather? Uh, you know, I, I hesitate to call it a gift, you know. Um, around the time my mother started disappearing, I got this idea that uh, 
if I walked the, my, my elementary school was up the street from my grandmother's house where I was living at the time. And I got this idea that if I walked the sidewalk squares perfectly, and I couldn't put two feet in any sidewalk square, I couldn't step on the line between. If I walked the sidewalk perfectly when I got home, my mother would be there. Mm -hmm. And it worked once. So from there, I got this notion that, well, if I just eradicate all imperfections from myself, mm -hmm. then things won't go wrong. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, I tell people, and excuse the language for the young people, that the sort of muscle you build as an orphan is the muscle of a whore. Mm -hmm. yeah? You quickly learn how to do and say and be whatever it is you need to do or say mm -hmm. or be to get what you need, mm -hmm. some food, place to sleep for the night, whatever. Excellent. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that just happened to be a very useful skill for giving a speech. <laughs> you know, you just try to be perfect, man. You try to remember, look at people in the face, say the words perfectly. And I was rewarded for that, and it got me a long way. Um, whereas there was another kid in my fifth grade class, Mauricio, and I write about him in the book, um, who also has some crazy stuff going on in his life. Uh, but rather than deciding to be perfect, Mauricio decided one day to lie down in the middle of the road and wait for a car to run him over. Now, Mauricio was punished for this mm -hmm. act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Not by the car running over. No, the car did not run him over, no. But he was brought back, he was, we had corporal punishment in Texas in those days, so it was like he was paddled and plied with ADD medicine. And I try to compare these two boys, mm -hmm. both of whom are going through uh, horrible traumas that mm -hmm. we wouldn't want any child to go through. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that the child that conforms is protected, mm -hmm. is rewarded. Mm -hmm. But the child who very reasonably rebels and laments mm -hmm. is punished and mm -hmm. hopefully um, rather than praising the gift of Casey Gerald, the 11-year-old boy who can say a perfect speech, we can weep for Mauricio. Mm -hmm. So, and you're getting ahead of me. Sorry. That's, that's okay. I saw that. I, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, but I want to stay right with this. Um, mm -hmm. you, d you didn't call it a gift, but everybody else thought it was. Yeah. Because uh, apparently you could write very well early on. Didn't read a lot, but uh, you had something with you and the use of language. Yeah. Later on, you talk about the power of being a sorcerer of language, but yeah. at this point, you're young, and you write a speech, and what, 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 what is it, uh, this is, I guess you were in the fifth or sixth grade? I was in fifth grade. Fifth grade, you write this speech that is apparently so good, what happens, what, how does the teacher respond? I've forgotten her name. Miss Davis. Miss Davis, 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 yeah. Miss yeah. Davis, yeah. I give the speech, and she says, oh, Casey, Gerald, you are it. And I was like, what am I? What do you mean? <laughs> And so she, she comes we, from behind the desk. Yeah, yeah, she comes from behind. She says, so she tapped me to be the speaker for the Black History Month oratorical competition. We, I grew up in an all-black neighborhood, and so, every, you know, everything, honestly, every day was Black History Month. So it was like, you know, it was beautiful, actually. It was a great gift, actually, to, in a society that is designed to destroy black people, to be raised Surrounded. by um, people for whom it never occurred to any of us that we were inferior because we were black. Mm -hmm. It was a great, and I didn't realize it until I went to Yale, honestly, mm -hmm. what a great gift <laughs> <laughs> I had been given. Mm -hmm. uh, I write in the book, uh, all, I never understood the motives of white people. All I knew is I was not white and I would have been heartbroken if I had been born white. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was, that sense of self-worth mm -hmm. was very important. Even in the midst of drama. Even in the midst of drama, it was very important. So Ms. Davis says, you're gonna be the one to speak on behalf of us. And, um, you know, I always compared myself to my grandfather, who was a minister. And he had been, you know, his grandmother had been born a slave. Mm -hmm. He was raised in this little town in Texas on a dirt floor house. And he starts preaching when he was 16. And he was paid in canned goods. I mean, this is how poor they were. But you watch what he was able to do with language. I say, we were saying earlier, the preacher has a very hard job. They have to tell a 2,000-year-old story over and over and over again and keep people from walking out on them, you know. Um, but what he was able to do to bring new language to a really old and otherwise tired story uh, set a standard for me that I try to do in this book. How do you bring new, fresh language to things that people think they understand? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the speech that you give lands you, uh, you win a contest. Yep. Right? Yeah. All right. So this is going to be the beginning of you recognizing, you recognizing about the power of language, and you're pretty good at this thing. I'll yeah? take your word for it. No, no, you were, you were pretty good at this yeah. thing. But other people are starting to recognize that you have some skills. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But this is the point where you also, and you made a point, to, uh, you, you uh, alluded to this earlier, about the idea of this is what they want and this is what I'm going to give them. Mm -hmm. Now, but getting to be on the football field is a little bit different, isn't it? How did you wind up playing football? Well, I played football initially just because uh, my daddy wanted me to. I write in the book, um, the great man is an inconvenience as a father because every uh, boy wants to be his own man right. until it happens. Right. <laughs> uh, and I said, I kind of envied so many of my friends that I grew up with who were told so often by so many, your daddy ain't shit. Uh -huh. Because for all the things I could and did and will say about mine, I couldn't say he wasn't shit. Uh -huh. He was the greatest man that I had ever known and his daddy was the greatest man that he had ever known and that was most likely the root of all the evil inside each of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you go, um, you, you play what position in, on the football team? Uh, initially, I just played runner, you know, because right. like, you, you were fast. <laughs> yeah, because I was fast, and, right. and I was on the junior varsity, and, and we were losing really horribly. Mm -hmm. And uh, my coach, who was my track coach, and he was also the coach of the junior varsity, he said, Case, you know, put your helmet on, man, because I was just kind of a bit. He said, put your helmet on, man. And here's and y'all were new, losing. We were losing, yeah. yeah. He said, here's the new play. Y'all run this way. Casey, you run that way. <laughs> and I was, like, yeah, I was like, cool, fine with me. It was just like a wind sprint. And um, I think people were so surprised by how dumb the play was that I, like, scored a touchdown. It's like, he was like, you know, do it again. This is great, you know. So next thing you know, the next week, I played high school football with an incredible, greatest athlete I've ever played with, Lindy Holmes, who went on to play at the University of Oklahoma for the Redskins. And uh, he, Lindy had gotten injured, and he was running an option package on the football team. And so one day uh, when he was he hadn't recovered yet from a, from a shoulder injury. Mm -hmm. All right, the varsity head coach said, Casey, I got to play, you know. <laughs> Y'all run this way, Casey, you run that way. And, uh, and it still worked. Uh -huh. It was very interesting. So that one play showed up on film and got me recruited to college. I mean, right. it was all kind of accidental. But they did learn eventually how to catch you, though, right? I mean, they did. did catch they did, right. unfortunately. Yeah. But you yeah. were fast. Yeah, you were especially fast. when I was scared. Yeah, scared, yeah. right, 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 right. right. Yeah. So uh, that leads us to, um, you did say that uh, it, it showed up on film, and you were, were a pretty good student, apparently. Yeah. Is that right? I mean, I'm not just copying You're a pretty good student. And, um, and everybody, a big day is to the, the idea of National Signing Day. But leading up to that, you're going to be recruited by the um, University of Kansas, maybe one other school I don't recall, but then there's the school in Connecticut, mm -hmm. Yale. And um, so how did people respond to the possibility of a young black kid from South Oak Cliff going to Yale? Um, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to a lot of people in my community. You know, I'd go to the grocery store and they'd say, oh, are you that kid that's going to Yale? And I'd say, yes, man. I'd go to church and they'd come up crying. You know, I'd say, you, you going to mm -hmm. National Signing Day came and the groundskeeper of the stadium he pulled his little card up and he came over and he said, hey son, uh, you that boy they talking about going to Yale? I mm -hmm. said, yes sir. And he put his hands on my shoulder and he starts crying. He said, go all the way son, mm -hmm. go all the way. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea where all the way was or how mm -hmm. to get there, but mm -hmm. I saw that uh, these people uh, had been waiting so mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm to go mm -hmm. all the way. And this, this, um, this book is in a tradition, you know? I was in Baltimore the other day and for my book tour, and something had gone really wrong with my scheduling, and mm -hmm. I started getting very upset. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered that I was in Frederick Douglass's hometown. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that when Mr. Douglass released his first book, mm -hmm. he had to flee the country because he would have been murdered mm -hmm. if they caught him because what he'd done was illegal. Mm -hmm. So I'm very mindful. I'm very mindful that I'm releasing this book the same year that we finally got Zora Neale Hurston. Y'all know who Zora Neale Hurston mm -hmm. is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Zora Neale Hurston's uh, uh, Barracoon, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. chronicle of the last person to be it's captured like and slavery. right mm -hmm. brought over mm -hmm. on the transatlantic slave trade. And when Zora Neale Hurston, this brilliant woman, takes this incredibly important book to her editor at Viking. 
They said, hey, we can't publish this unless you make Cujo sound like a civilized English-speaking person. Mm -hmm. And Zorna Hurston, this incredible, brilliant woman, genius, mm -hmm. says, well, you can keep your money. Mm -hmm. And she winds up dying in a, you know, unmarked, being buried in an unmarked grave, a pauper, because she had that kind of integrity. I say this to say, I am uh, completely aware that I'm working in a tradition mm -hmm. where the central question is, uh, how are we going to mm -hmm. survive and, and get free mm -hmm. in this society? Mm -hmm. And so um, going all the way was not just about me going to Yale. Mm -hmm. It was about us going, going somewhere. Yeah. So you're yeah. going to be faced with a crisis at, this, at another point. Um, let's, we'll move the story along. Yeah. Um, the, you're going to be successful at Yale. Um, academically, there are going to be some challenges along the way. The uh, team's going to be very successful. And then, but then there's this opportunity for you to, um, you're going to be a, a finalist uh, for the Rhodes Scholar, mm -hmm. to be a Rhodes Scholar, among other honors. So this is a big deal. The problem is that the day of the interview is also the day of the game between Harvard and Yale. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. And so you've got to figure out how, you, you, so you make this distinction about uh, and maybe you'll talk a little bit about this. When should you make a sacrifice on behalf of a friend or on behalf of an institution? Mm. Yeah, I used to think for a long time uh, that causes were the most important thing. You know, um, I used to go back to high schools when I was first in college and talk to kids. And I said, listen, y'all, nobody cares really what you're going through. You just got to get over it, and, you know, focus on, do your work, you know, work hard, keep your head down, keep grinding. Shortly after I started this book, um, one of my closest friends from Yale, who I had helped recruit, he was like a little brother to me. Um, he was from St. Louis, and had had a very similar childhood, had been homeless for, you know, a while as a kid, and, um, very, traumatic experiences, um, but had become quote-unquote successful, yeah? And shortly after I finished this book, he, uh, he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. This is Elijah. Elijah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to me in a dream shortly after that, and he said, he was sitting in a booth in a diner, and he leaned back and he said, you know, Case, we did a lot of things that we wouldn't advise anybody we love to do. And then I woke up. And I realized that, and this is what I went back and told a group of young people, uh, freshmen at Yale a few uh, months ago. I said, we got really good at making great people. Mm -hmm. What we didn't do was make free people, make whole people people who, this goes to your question of why I wrote the book, I had achieved all of these things, but I was so cracked up. You know, I had gone to the schools, I had given the talks, I was on the cover of the magazines, you know, people said you were successful, but I couldn't sleep, and I was crying a lot, and I was anxious, I was depressed all the time, I mean, I was real, you see, I just wanted to know what was wrong with me, man, you know. So I, so, uh, I started this book just to trace the cracks of my own life. You know, we, we go through so many things as kids, and we just kind of keep running from mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. But what I found, and what my friend Elijah told me, he taught me, you know, is that all the things you run from come running after you. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you got to face them. Mm -hmm. And if you face them, you can heal from them. Mm -hmm. So this question of mm -hmm. what matters most, your cause mm -hmm. or your friend, mm -hmm. your friend is your cause, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time, and it mm -hmm. took me losing my friend mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to, to realize that. The, um, you leave Yale, and I, I, I guess we should wrap up the story about, um, I'd like to do this part about the Rhodes Scholar. Uh, one of the questions, you didn't get it. You were, yeah. you were, you were a finalist, uh, but you didn't get it, and, uh, and, and you lost the game too, right? Mm -hmm. All right so that's a bad weekend. <laughs> one day. One yeah, day, right? One day. day. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, was, I recall the question that um, the questioner asked you, mm -hmm. which was, what was the last book that you read that did not include race? Yeah. What did you think about that question? Um, well, it was, 
I write in the book, and I try to be very cautious. You know? I write in the book, it was either strange, lazy, or racist, <laughs> or all three. I mean, it was a very peculiar question because, uh, one, there hadn't been a single book written in this country that doesn't have something to do with race. I mean, even if it's a book with all white people or a book with all whatever, uh, a, you know, just you know, carnival circus performance, there's something. Anything that comes out of America has something to do with race. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, but the other thing, and this is the, this actually gets to this book, I actually hadn't read a single book in full mm -hmm. uh, since I was in maybe fifth grade, you yeah. um, I didn't read, you know, when I was a kid, which does not mean that I did not get vital information. Um, but reading was not a central part of my life, and, and, fun, and my editor was very shocked when she read that. She was like, well, how do you... How do you know all yeah. these... You quote but, Shakespeare, you yeah. quote every, you quote all. Yeah. I started reading when I was about 23, and it's been so useful for me to have my own self-guided education rather than all the stuff that my teachers thought I ought to read. I read the stuff that actually spoke to me. And this book, I think, benefits a great deal mm -hmm. by being written by someone who is not, um, who, is, who sees albums, for example, you know, like the Miseducation of Lauryn Hill or Channel Orange or whatever, who sees albums as important and beautiful and magical and, and informative as Works books. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one of my friends is a rapper in Atlanta, and he called me a few days ago, and he was like, you know, I, yeah, I posted something on Instagram, and he said, you know, uh, I don't read, man, but I think I'm going to read your book because it's almost like something that we would read in high school, but it's about us. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's exactly right. I said, Chris, the rappers are the most important writers working today because they're writing about real life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you know, me and my friends growing up, we didn't have $27 to spend on anything. And, you know, we needed something that would speak to us mm -hmm. in a real way, not mm -hmm. something that would just convince people that we were smart and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, civilized folks. Yeah. Well, I know that um, we, uh, you're going to go to Harvard Business School. Uh, not the University of Louisville where you would have gotten a better education, but right. <laughs> yeah. you went to the Harvard Business School and that would lead you on to Wall Street and, um, and for the benefit of, because we're going to take some questions here, but that leads us back to, I think, the beginning, which is why you have entitled this book, There Will Be No Miracles Here. Mm -hmm. Why did you select that title and would you sort of put that in context of what you found after you yeah. left HBS? Yeah, the title is a very pro-miracle book, actually. I'm a very pro-magic person. Mm -hmm. And the title, actually, I, I found a post on Tumblr some years ago, 2013, actually. And it was just a cool art installation by this artist, Nathan Coley. And it just said, there will be no miracles here. I thought this was really cool. So I researched the story behind it. And it's an apocryphal story from a village in medieval France where the peasants, uh, started experiencing what they called miracles and this sort of mass hysteria ensued so they stopped working and they put down their plow and this pissed off all the people oh. in charge yeah mm -hmm. so they're like you got to get back to work we need this to you know um, and they couldn't coerce the peasants to start back working so they finally went to the king of France and the king of France's solution was to have a sign placed in the middle of the village that said, there will be no miracles here by order of the king. <laughs> you know? And I love that uh, because it's so absurd, but it also really speaks to what I saw from people in power, whether it was at Yale or Harvard or on Wall Street or at Washington. I was, had dinner with George Bush a couple years ago. I mean, it's there as well. Um, uh, uh, the book and my life is written from the perspective of a peasant boy mm -hmm. who winds up spending a lot of time with King. Mm -hmm and comes back to the village and mm -hmm. says, it's time to put down the plow. Mm -hmm. No matter what they say, if they say it's not going to be any miracles, I got a different mm -hmm. view on things. Yeah. yeah. So it's about liberation, hopefully. It's about hope. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is about hope. Yeah. You yeah. wrote about the Hope Gardens in um, Harlem. Yeah. Uh, I think that was correct. Yeah. But, but it seems that you end on a hopeful note, although the notion of miracles um, I, I suspect that you had some different thoughts about miracles. This is not magic. Hmm. 
I don't know, man, you know. I mean, my friend comes to me in this dream and gives me the key to my book. And I just put the dream, the two dreams that I just transcribed mm -hmm. in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very supernatural experience. Uh, I, 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 I love that. I believe in, I believe in the supernatural. Life. That's good. I mean, life is too nasty not to uh -huh. believe in magic. Good. You know? So the gospel of doubt, but not... The gospel of doubt wasn't mm -hmm. about doubting. First off, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, it was about doubting, but that wasn't the end of it. Mm -hmm. First off, the title came from one of Pope Francis's encyclicals, and this mm -hmm. is the Pope. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then the Pope <laughs> says, hey, if you want to actually practice true faith, you have to leave a little room for doubt. Yeah. This is the vicar of Christ. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's not an anti-faith uh, message. Mm -hmm. Secondly, mm -hmm. the gospel of doubt was not, hey, doubt God and doubt mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. It was doubt all the people who are in charge who are yeah. telling you they're looking out for you because mm -hmm. they're not. Yeah. But nobody wanted to catch that message. Yeah, I love it. This that. is too real. Let's take some questions from the floor. And there's a microphone right over here. We'd ask you if you did, just go get the microphone really quick. Okay. There you are. And uh, looking forward to hearing some of the questions. Please speak up nice and loudly. Yeah. Give us your name, too. Uh, Jeremy Jones. Um, at one point in time, you said there was a point in your life where you didn't want to be on the earth anymore. Uh, was there a person or anything that drove you to, like, keep going? Yeah, there, um, and this kind of gets to the question of hope. A friend of mine says, uh, hope is just the belief that our tomorrow can be better than our today. I really like that. Um, I had sort of gotten to a place where uh, you kind of live yourself into a dead end. Yeah. And... There was just some notion to me that, well, I can do something a little differently. And if I do something differently today, do I feel better? And you put one day in front of the other, it's almost like playing a game or, you know, uh, uh, playing a sport. You get a little better every day. You get closer to life every day. So I think more than anything, that point of not being alive was not so, of not wanting to be alive. I sort of saw it less as not wanting to be alive at all and more as I don't want to live like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. was a very important difference. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I knew exactly how I did want to live. But as a mentor of mine says, she says, sometimes it's not about knowing what you want to do, it's about knowing what you're not going to do. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, I found a lot of hope in that, to say, yeah, I'm not going to live like this. But then this becomes an adventure of saying, well, how am I going to live? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you, Braxton. Uh, okay. uh, Braxton Young, Central High School. Uh, I just wanted to know if you were alive as if, like, you were there when your father was handed that envelope of cocaine, what would you say to your father in that situation? Hmm. Like, would you, would you, tell, would you tell him, because I'm a football player too, so I understand the love of the game, yeah. but would you, would you tell him not to do it? Or would you just let it all plan, uh, pan out you know, or you'd not change a thing? I mean, my hope is that, uh, my hope is that I tell him not to do it, but I don't know, you know? Um, my hope is that I tell him not to do it, and my hope is that he'd listen. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Is, is your father still alive today? He is, yeah. And funny enough, he... Um, and this gets to the system of football that I'm talking about. He is 60, he'll be 63 soon, and he's still having surgeries on his back. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, um, you played in the, the Yale Harvard game, right? Yeah. Right. Um, what, how's it feel to play in a big old school rivalry? Yeah, it's beautiful, man. You know, the, the, this is one of the reasons this book is a sports book because um, there are these moments 
Uh, actually, I want to read. I'll read sure. this little passage because it's really. I'll say it's really great. I don't know. You can tell me if you, <laughs> if you, yeah, yes, you can tell me if it's really great. Um, but I really like this. Uh, all right. There we go. So this is a, a big game against Princeton right before the big game against Harvard. So this Princeton game, there are like 50,000 people, you know, 40,000, 50,000 people in the stands. This thing. So it says, we have reached the holy moment that comes in some games when you stand on the field and spin around to look out and up at 50, 60,000 bodies smashed together in the stands. When what was once a dean, a senator, a dining hall worker, your mother, is now a blot in a great sea of blues and tweeds and fur and orange or crimson. When the noise is so loud and varied that the thousand voices become one voice and the cold wind blows across from a sliver of the North Atlantic to make the flags atop the stadium all wave in one direction. And the 40 practices and 100 hours of film and thousand plays have turned 11 boys into one body that looks at itself in the mirror and asks, what am I about to do? And knows, and knows. In the midst of all the chaos comes a moment when it is still and quiet down on the field. We had reached that moment in this game against Princeton, but we were tired and we knew, or at least I feared, that we were about to lose. Yeah. So yes, there are these perfect. moments yeah. of transcendence, man. You know, I watched this great video of the few days before Aretha Franklin died. Mm -hmm. And her granddaughter had taken a video of her sitting at the piano, singing, playing mm -hmm. the piano. And that idea that there are some experiences, whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's painting, whether it's sports, that actually takes you to a different place of human experience. Mm -hmm. and, and that for me, and this is why I don't want to throw the game of football right, away, right, right. even as we critique the system. Uh, the game for me was that, and I tried to capture that. Yeah. Oh, and beautifully so. Yes. The athletic director claps. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, my name is Raymond Green, uh, principal at Central High School. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for all of your words today, and I'm thinking about, uh, Dr. Irvin, how, how all 1,200 of my students can hear this, mm -hmm. and how much is it going to cost me to buy this book for all 1,200, because <laughs> all of my kids need to experience uh, your story. Um, my question today is about high school and your experience in high school, and as I've listened to you talk, it reminds me a lot of uh, Paulo Freire and the pedagogy of the oppressed. Yeah and education for, for the sake of liberation. So in that idea, my question is, what was um, some of the highlights of your high school experience that was positive in a formative way? And more importantly, what should high school look like today to achieve the education uh, for the sake of liberation, kind of what you're talking about? So Great. good, excellent question, so good. I'll read a very short passage, so sorry. I've, the best of me is in this book. I really pale in comparison to it, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Um, all right, here we go. Um, This was the highlight of my high school experience. Um, and it's about me and my friends. Yeah. Um, one of my closest friends was a, he was a year ahead of me, Juice. And he was the head of, at Dallas, is, Oak Cliff is kind of broken up in a little neighborhood. And each neighborhood had its own gang. And Juice was the head of the gang that represented Beckley Sainer. I was from Singing Hill. Juice and I ran track together, and he, uh, for some reason, protected me. Like, I, did, I could never fight, and Juice was like, always, if somebody <laughs> bothered me, like, Juice was there, you know? And uh, so I was writing about, uh, I was writing about uh, what friendship looked like between kids that had been forgotten, you know? And I said, 
The only way I start to understand it is by looking past the surface of the violence into the packs of brawling gangsters to see my friend and brother Juice, who was just like me in ways that we both recognized but could not articulate. We both knew he was smarter than he let on. We knew that he never complained about the nights he and his older brother slept in the park, nowhere else to go. And we knew, or now I know, that beneath the mask of viciousness, Juice was just a little boy. We were all just little boys, you know. Somebody must have forgotten that, forgotten us. So we found each other. And even here, even here, in this forgotten world, there was joy. The joy that comes from freedom, a teenage thirst for life outside the rules, beyond reach, without the illusion of security. That year I felt the joy of making life on my own terms in whatever way I could, stayed at so many houses that I can't tell you where I slept most nights, bathed only when I could no longer bear the stench, drank from water hoses instead of faucets, lived on a diet of zebra cakes and Fanta and hot wings, spent aimless hours, days with my friends who were often as free as I. We started to grow up or at least get older. We shared what little we had of food and money. We made football fields in the street and devastating jokes in the barbershop. And out of the naked crust of lost boys, we made something like a family. Um, my, everybody was having a hard time in my high school. Um, in fact, the fact that I had a stable place to stay put me sort of like I was like, you know, the Vanderbilt, you know, really. Um, once my sister came back and we moved in together. And so I think more than anything, what I wish high school, especially high schools like mine, had more of, was kindness, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, which is somewhat strange, I guess, as a pedagogy. But um, we were all treated so cruelly, and we were just children, you know, who were having a hard time. The, the police department used to come and do drug raids with dogs and stuff in our high school. That, they came more than the SAT prep people or more than the, or more than the um, counselors or more than, you know, the, folk, the food stamps people. We probably could have used more food than drug raids, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the way our teachers would <clears throat> sort of berate us so often, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, there was just such cruelty. And I think for kids who are already um, traumatized, we could use a little more kindness, you know. That's a separate piece from all the things I think we should teach differently. But if I could do one thing, and I go to a lot of high schools in neighborhoods like mine, uh, you know, you have no idea uh, that you may be the only person uh, to say a kind word, I mean, you know, you're a principal, but you have no idea that you might be the only person mm -hmm. to say good morning mm -hmm. to a kid, and that kid might have walked in your class, you know, raising hell, cussing at everybody, throwing stuff all over the floor, but you have no idea that maybe they didn't, you know, have anything to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think more than anything, mm -hmm. uh, we can use a little kindness. Last question, and we have to wrap up. Okay. Braxton, we're going to do an interview, just me and you, man. We'll do a podcast. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> well, um, I, I didn't mean to hug the No, you did, man. It's great. But um, the Apocalypse of John, Revelation 119, uh, you said, write the things which thou hast seen. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know, um, breaking that down, what does that mean to you? Mm. It means two things. Um, uh, Job, Job says at some point, Job is always, I think, trying to figure out, why in the hell have I had to go through so much <laughs> hardship? <laughs> you know, and he really works out. His wife is like, this God dude hates you, man. Amen. Like, Amen. forget it. And Job is like so, he's such a compelling study because everything keeps going wrong. And he keeps trying to figure out the higher purpose. 
And at the end, at some point, he says, I escaped alone to tell thee. Maybe the only reason I, Job, am the only one still here is because I had to be the one to tell you. And I think about so many um, people that I have known, whether it's my father or my mother or Mauricio or Juice or my sister, whatever, or my grandmother's grandfather who was born a slave in Texas. And, um, uh, you know, in our, in our tradition, the griot is a sacred role. Um, but the griot cannot be a propagandist. Yeah? You see what I'm saying? The, the griot can't let his mm -hmm. or her mm -hmm. personal agenda get in the way of telling the people what they need to know. So I, I took that as just tell people the truth, man. Don't try to gus it up and put your spin on things. I want it, what do they say? Wanted receipts, you know? Yeah. Uh, you <laughs> got to have the receipts, man. Uh, you got to have the receipts. So that's what I tried to do with this book so that you walk away not feeling that, oh, this dude was just trying to sell you a false bill of goods, but damn, he actually got it okay. and yes, told you about it. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Yeah. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, would you please thank our guest, Stacey Gerald, <laughs> who will be um, in an extended interview tonight at the Kentucky Author Forum, uh, interviewed by Van Jones, who many of you may know from CNN and other um, high-profile media spots, but if you are a member of the University of Louisville faculty, a student, uh, we, have, uh, we have tickets for you that are at a discount. We have a great relationship with the Kentucky Office Forum. We can find a place for you tonight, and um, I think that starts at 7 o'clock, so you need to be there around 6, 6.30. And, um, but a great book, and we have some signed copies over here by our um, favorite independent bookseller, uh, Carmichael's, and we thank them for being here today, too. And thank all of you who have joined us for this special edition of the um, Kentucky Authors Forum at the University of Louisville. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.